This is your four minute warning. Our next session will begin right at 11 a.m. All right, it is officially 11 a.m. and we will start our next session now. We'd like to introduce Andrea and Nick and invite them to turn on their cameras. Okay, I'm figuring that out. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, thanks for attending our presentation today about the Grant Boltel Oral Histories and Traditional Knowledge Digital Collection. The official title of the collection given by Mr. Grant Boltel himself is Iwalawi Lokibaka, the Grant Boltel Apsaluka Stories Collection. The word Iwalawi Lokibaka translates to how we have lived in the Crow language while the term Apsaluka is what the Crow call themselves and roughly translates to people who live like birds along the riverbanks. This collection is an amazing account of exactly what the title suggests, how the Crow have lived. Grant shares oral histories and knowledge of the natural world as the Crow have experienced it over thousands of years. He documents, his, he documents their experiences from their creation on the banks of the Yellowstone River to their transcontinental migration that took them west from Yellowstone, across the Pacific, across Asia and Europe, 
across the Atlantic Ocean, and finally back to Yellowstone. He provides detailed directions for how to kill a dinosaur, and even tells how a crow warrior named Uki killed the last dinosaur that the Apsaluka encountered. Mr. Boltel also documents his people's more modern and urgent history, the environmental catastrophes that they face, their betrayals at the hands of the U.S. Army and the U.S. government, and even times that Crow warriors defeated U.S. soldiers. He shares the Apsaluka's rich and incredible history and their knowledge of the natural world as it has been passed to him through the historians and the chiefs that he grew up around, some of whom were his family. He discusses how the history of the Crow people has been manipulated, lost, and distorted through the 19th and 20th centuries. Mr. Boltel's oral histories provide an overlooked perspective of U.S. history that is so important to hear and share. It is hard to overstate what an amazing opportunity and honor it has been for Andrea and myself to work alongside Grant and everyone involved with this project to develop such an important collection. Our digital collection is just a small part of the work currently being done to digitize and preserve Apsaluka histories and culture. We have a slide towards the end with links to some of this other work, but I'd like to make special mention now of the folks at Little Bighorn College in Crow Agency, Montana, who have also been working to create metadata and digitize their collections of Apsaluka history. In fact, original copies of the Iwalawi Loki Baka collection will not only be housed at the Fife Folklore Archives at Utah State, they will also be held at Little Bighorn College and at the Jackson Historical Society and Museum in Jackson, Wyoming. And our hope and understanding moving forward is that the metadata that we have worked so responsibly to develop can be used by these institutions and that we can link with their content so that our combined work of digitizing Crow oral histories and culture can be shared broadly, especially within communities of the absolute good. So with that brief overview of the collection aside, let me formally introduce myself and how I came to work with all of the amazing people involved with this project. I will then share a bio of Mr. Boltel and play a clip from the collection in which he shares his purpose for creating and sharing these oral histories and his knowledge. Then I will talk with y'all about some of the complexities that I faced as I was watching videos and creating metadata before handing off to my colleague and metadata master, Andrea Payan, to talk about the quality control process that we developed for this collection. Um, this process ensures that we are being responsible with the material that Grant has shared with us and creating metadata that is accurate and accessible to as many audiences as possible and that meets the needs and standards as expressed to us by Mr. Boltel and the other creators of this content. So, my name is Nick Gittens. I attended Utah State University from 2008 to 2017 and I've worked at the Merrill Kazir Library since 2011. I started working at the library uh, in the circulation department, and I still do, but I always had a hope of eventually getting an opportunity to work with the folks in the five folklore archives and special collections. I received my degree in history in 2017 with minors in Latin and ancient Greek, and much of my research centered around oral traditions, storytelling, theater, and effective poetry in the ancient Mediterranean world and how often elements of these things snuck into the historical narrative or were completely dismissed out of hand for ridiculous reasons. Although I spent most of my time at Utah State studying the ancient Mediterranean, I loved folklore and the folklore program at USU. Multiple times I squeezed extra folklore classes into my schedule and in the fall of 2012 I was lucky enough to enroll in a folklore class taught by Mr. Grant Boltel. It was unlike any class I had ever taken before it was unlike any presentation I've ever been to, any webinar, any lecture. I've never experienced anything like this class. It was amazing. Grant would start speaking at the beginning of each class period, and he would weave his oral histories into the traditional uh, white historical narrative with which the majority of his class would have been more familiar. It was astounding. It was an incredible perspective that spoke deeply to the injustices and environmental catastrophes that the Crow and other indigenous people experienced in the 19th and 20th centuries and that they continue to face now. The class was so packed with information that sometimes I would have to just sit and listen and hope that my brain could remember everything that Grant was saying. Sometimes I couldn't take notes because I couldn't keep up, 
but Grant was gracious with all of his students and he would meet them wherever they were. It was a wonderful class and at the end of the semester I recognized that I had just undergone an experience that most people would never be able to have. I was so grateful, but I was also a little bit disappointed. I didn't know if I would ever be able to experience something like that again. But in the spring of 2019, after years of working hard around the library and repeatedly expressing my interest in the five folklore archives to my boss, I was finally given the opportunity to work as an intern in the archives. And I was introduced to Randy Williams, the former curator of the five folklore archives. It was great. It was a perfect mentor mentee match. Randy and I hit it off right away. In one of our first conversations, as we were ironing out the details of my internship, Randy shared that special collections and archives had received material donated by Mr. Grant Boltel of the Crow Nation. My heart leapt out of my chest. The universe was opening a door that I thought had been closed forever. And I was receiving another chance to experience the wealth of knowledge and incredible perspective of Grant Boltel all over again. And not only was I getting a chance to learn from Grant again, but I could play an important role in creating a repository that centers his voice and his people's important history. I jumped at the opportunity and I have not looked back. Uh, but I don't think at that time, any of us really realized the size and scope of the project we were undertaking. But I'm gonna save that conversation for a little bit later when we're talking about metadata. So now that you know a little bit about me, let me introduce you to Mr. Grant Boltel. Grant Boltel was born in 1940 and grew up at, on a horse ranch in the Pryor Mountains of Montana, but also spent much of his youth in the Hart Mountain, Wyoming area. In both states, he worked as a ranch hand and competed professionally in local rodeos. His original home in Montana stood close to the home of the renowned Crow leader and a relative of Grant's, Chief Plenty Coup. Plenty Coup's old home, which is close to the spot where Grant grew up, is now a museum called the Chief Plenty Coup Museum. Grant's name in the Crow language is Biche Sawache, one who sits among the buffalo. And he comes from one of the last traditional storytelling families of the Absaluka. His great, great, great grandmother had a brother who was one of the last Akbindawo, a word which translates to knowledge of the universe. This person was a storyteller, a geographer, a meteorologist, and an ethnographer, among other things. And as Grant says, the Akbindawo knew everything that the Crow needed to know to survive, including their history. Mr. Boltel is a member of the Uwutashe, or Greasy Mouth Clan, and a child of his father's clan, the Ashiehushe, or Soilet Clan. He is a member of the Crow Culture Commission at Crow Agency Montana, a lodge erector and a pipe carrier in his people's sacred tobacco society and a Vietnam War veteran having served in the Marines. In the mid 1960s, after serving with the Marines, Grant caught a bus from California back to Montana and had a four hour layover in Logan, Utah. He decided to check out what was going on with the old buildings on top of the hill and he immediately fell in love with Utah State University. Shortly after returning to Montana and getting married, he spent a year at Utah State, during which time he studied with folklorist Austin Fife. His relationship with USU and the Fife Folklore Archives continued, developed, continued to develop throughout the years, and since his initial experiences, Grant has served as both a visiting lecturer and an adjunct professor. And much of the content in the collection was actually filmed during these visits to USU. While he was teaching here in 2009, he worked together with folklorist Sharon Kaheen, the former director of the Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum, and Jeannie Thomas, a folklorist in the English department at Utah State, to establish the Native Memory Oral History Project, through which the group was able to further develop the collection. Over the period from 2001 to 2018, they filmed the grant sharing stories of how the crow lived and the edible and medicinal plants that they used in and around the territories where the Apsaluka used to wander, including spots around Yellowstone National Park, the Hart Mountain, Wyoming area, and Rainy Buttes, South Dakota, where Grant tells the Battle of Rainy Buttes and explains how Crow warriors killed Sitting Bull. This brief list mentions only highlights as the group filmed in dozens of different locations. 
And during this time, Mr. Boltel also began working with Randy Williams and Brad Cole in the Fife Folklore Archive to develop a plan for archiving his people's oral histories and working with regional partners to create a robust digital collection. Utah State received material intermittently between 2012 and 2018. In the spring of 2018, when the last materials were deposited, Randy Williams began working with Grant to get a signed memorandum of understanding from the Crow Nation. Once the memorandum was obtained, in the spring of 2019, the USU Library began working on the collection, and I was lucky enough to become involved processing metadata, basically watching videos, and documenting it all. But before we start talking about metadata and spreadsheets and everything that goes with that, I would like to play a short video from the collection and allow Mr. Boltel himself to explain the significance of the oral histories and the knowledge that he shares and why it is so, so important for this knowledge to be preserved. So one moment while I switch to the video. Okay, here we go. Yeah, uh, my name is Grant Bulltail. My dad's name is George Bulltail, and his dad is Simon Bulltail. And uh, and his dad was uh, Bobtail Bear, and then uh, his dad was uh, uh, Buffalo Calf Soup, and his dad was Twins Tail. And uh, so when my dad was a boy, uh, most of uh, his, his grandfather, his dad and his grandfather and uh, granduncles were still alive and uh, they told stories. And my dad listened to these stories uh, about certain uh, names for, uh, for the land that we roamed about. And uh, they told stories about the old days and uh, uh, my dad's uh, mother was called Pretty Sweathouse, and her mother was Goswell, and then uh, uh, her father was uh, Medicine Bird, and uh, they uh, and and his mother was was uh, goes along a straight line, and her father was uh, long hair. So uh, they were important people, and uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, her, her my, my dad's uh, grandfather on on uh, his mother's side on his mother's side was a pretty sweet house, and then her father, a uh, bird who flies over the earth. And then uh, his father was uh, old as a bull blinking his eyes, and then his father was a real man. And his wife was called uh, Runs Along, and his wife was, uh, Runs Along had seven brothers, and they were very famous chiefs. And uh, they, they wandered in the area between Texas and Denver, and in the summertime they would come into this area uh, into through the mountains in this area, and then they would follow the Mississippi River down to the the Hidatsa and fight the Sioux and the Cheyennes and the Blackfeet, and then return back to uh, Texas in in the fall. And uh, so they knew a lot of place names that they told my dad uh, when he was a boy. So that's why I knew a lot of place names. And then uh, my mother's. Uh, uh, adopted father was named Comes Up Red, and he lived uh, in the Wind River, in the Wind River area where he was born until 1872. And uh, from his stories, I know about the place names and things that happened and what they did. And uh, so, uh, well, uh, I must have a good memory because I remember most of them. Uh, and uh, we, uh, our people kept history. We, we had people in the tribe that kept history. We called them Agbino. And uh, they knew, it means knowledge of the universe. And they knew 
uh, were botanists, ethnographers, uh, geologists, um, anthropologists. They they knew everything that they were, they they had to know. They were also astronomers, and uh, they knew everything so well that even when they were traveling at night, when they were traveling and it was pitch dark. And uh, when when they sort of lost their way, they would ask this uh, a person who knew had the knowledge of the of the nat of the universe, and then uh, he would taste the ground. He would taste the uh, uh, he would taste uh, the soil, and then some of the vegetation and some of the rocks, and he would and know exactly where he was at. And he would say, we are at a certain place, and if we go in a certain direction, we'll be there at daylight. And it was always true. They knew exactly where they were at all time because they studied the earth and the wind and everything that there was to know. But the problem was there was only one man that had all this knowledge, and he only had one apprentice with him, and he, and he taught him all these things. And uh, they wrote down all the history, the whole history of our, of our people. Uh, and then uh, the smallpox epidemic in 1834 killed all the uh, Agbinoo, the people who had this knowledge, and, and their apprentice. They both died at the same time. So it was not carried out. It was not carried it, uh, after that and they, and they buried their knowledge with them, the things that they wrote down. And uh, so uh, after that our, our, uh, our history and our knowledge has been uh, receding. It, it's not, it's, uh, we remember some and we, and, uh, but it was not carried on extensively as it was. So that, that is, has been our problem. And then uh, during the reservation time, uh, they were more interested in, in, uh, in uh, the history that they taught in the schools. And uh, so we lost a lot of our history, but some people uh, went back and uh, remembered some of the history. And in, in 1921, uh, anthropologists and people came to try to find out who, what kind of people we were and where we came from and some of our history and uh, they were, there were so many uh, versions that uh, Chief Plenicus decided to, uh, to gather all the uh, knowledgeable people about our history and things that we knew and one winter in 1921 he gathered all these people at, people at his house and uh, and they talked about our history and uh, and the things that they knew. And my dad was there listening to all this. And uh, and now and that's and he passed his knowledge on to me. And uh, so I have this information today. And uh, there has been so much uh, half truth and and and. Uh, and uh, uh, and wrong information that, that I try to tell people what was told at that time. And uh, that has been my mission. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, in 1950s, uh, a historical society from London uh, s sent some money to the Crow tribe. Uh, and they wanted them to write their history. But uh, there was nobody that, that could write the history. So they ga gathered a, a lot of some people and, uh, and they, tried to, to, uh, they tried to trace our history, where we came from. And, and there was a lot of misinformation. And uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, the, they sort of formed a committee called the Culture Committee. And the people that were in charge were the ones that spoke good English and had some education but had no knowledge about our tribe, about how our culture and how we lived. And then uh, they suddenly wanted to know all these things. So uh, they see some things like we came from the Hidatsas 200 years ago and that's all misinformation because we were a tribe from the beginning and then uh, 
They said that when we were here from Mississippi River to the Columbia River and, uh, and through the mountains, mountain range here, there was nobody. They couldn't find anybody else that was living between Canada and Gulf of Mexico and between Mississippi and uh, Columbia River. There were no people. And uh, in, in our uh, uh, Genesis story, they believed that, uh, that the sun created us. And then he left. The sun left us. So, so our tribe tried to follow the sun and went westward and circumvented the earth and uh, finally came to the United States across the ocean and uh, so we, we had a lot of knowledge and I've been saying these things and now they're finding teepee rings in France where they, they, had, they stopped and tried to figure a way to cross the ocean and uh, they find the same arrow points there the Clovis points there that they find here so uh, yeah we kept that knowledge so now people are finding about these things and now they're saying that those people from France came over and taught us these things and went back. So now they're half truths and uh, and uh, twisted, the truth twisted. And uh, uh, I want people to know that we were the ones that circumvented the earth. And uh, and uh, we our our ancient ways of of culture are still there in 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 Europe. All over there, all over Europe, and uh, and so, but our history has been lost, and now we're trying to to uh, find out about our history, and we have lived here so long that we know everything that grows on this uh, in our area, from Canada to to uh, Mexico and Mississippi to uh, to. Uh, to the Columbia, and uh, one of our chiefs said uh, that uh, we we live in in uh, we live in on the best place on the earth because he said to the east the uh, the waters are always muddy and uh, crow dogs would not even drink that water, and uh, in the south it's warm and there is always sickness and people are 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 not healthy. And so we would not live there. And he said, to the east, people eat fish and are always picking fish out of their teeth. And crows would not live like that. And he said, in the north, it's it's too cold and horses could not live there. And uh, so they uh, go around with dogs. They go around in sleds pulled by dogs. And he said, that is not a way to live. And that is why we live in this area. And uh, so we knew exactly uh, uh, how to live in this environment. And uh, in, when my dad was, there are a lot of people that, that depended on the government after, after the treaties, 1868 and 1872, even before that, in 1825, they were, the government was giving rations to, to the tribes. And uh, so they depended a lot on these tribes because people were killing on the buffalo. And uh, I've seen photographs where people came and killed hundreds of wolves and stood in the middle to show how much they killed. And elk and deer and, and uh, prairie grizzly disappeared. And also the, the gray wolves disappeared. And after, uh, because they depended on the buffalo and the elk and the mountain sheep that were in the prairies. So uh, when, when no, they disappeared, they depended uh, a great deal on, on the government to give them rations. So they slowly lost uh, 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 the food that we were eating. We were going and harvesting and eating them. We didn't plan them. They were growing naturally. And 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 so and and then uh, there were so many people that they could not uh, uh, travel as extensively as they did. So we were gradually losing our knowledge of the things that we ate. And uh, the uh, the wild turkey. like we may be experiencing some
technical difficulties. I was just, we were at the end of the, the shared slide. So now I'm just going back to the presentation. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, so that's Grant Boltel in his own words, uh, as well as the, a little bit about the scope of this project. Um, I hope this little teaser of the wealth of knowledge in the Iwalawi Lokibaka collection has piqued your interest. And as I mentioned earlier, and as maybe you can see from that video, the size and scope of this collection is massive. So let's talk about some of the complex issues that we ran into while we were creating metadata and how USU developed policies and best practices for managing so much sensitive and important content. So yeah, this collection was massive and that apparent si or the size was not apparent at first glance. Um, we only really began to understand this as I worked through videos and created metadata. The collection, as donated, contained two hard drives that featured video, audio, and images. One was labeled the Spring Ranch Grant Boltel July 2015 U-State U Five Folklore Archives, and another was labeled Grant Boltel 2002 to 2016 Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum Five Folklore Archives USU. There are also a few handwritten notes from Mr. Boltel, a scrapbook commemorating a ceremony that took place at Heart Mountain, Wyoming, and nine Sony DV mini video cassette tapes. I began working on the Spring Ranch hard drive first. It contained 212 video files, 14 hours, 55 minutes, and 10 seconds worth of nonstop footage shot over five days in July of 2015 at Spring Ranch in Du Bois, Wyoming. All 212 videos were in .mov format and I worked with Andrea and my colleagues in digital initiatives at the Merrill Kazir Library to convert the files to mp4 and document the conversion process by noting it in the metadata and tracking both the old and new file names as well as where the file was and is now stored in the folklore archives as of when I am finished with it. All creator and contributor information was readily apparent and easily attributed. The location and dates are all stated clearly, easy peasy. For digital initiatives to convert the content of the Spring Ranch hard drive and for me to watch, listen, and create metadata that I felt was adequate and accessible enough took about a month and a half as I was only able to dedicate up to six hours of my time at work per week away from my service desk management responsibilities um, to work on the collection. But the process was smooth. All of the contrib contributors, as I said, were easy to attribute. The names of plants and important crow men and women are stated clearly. The videos were great to work with. As I was wrapping up the metadata on the Spring Ranch hard drive, I began browsing the content of the second hard drive. As the label suggests, it contained field work collected between 2002 and 2016 and stored in folders within folders within folders within folders within folders within folders. There were 459 video or audio files and hundreds of image files, all loosely organized by year. In total, the hard drive contains five days, six hours, two minutes, and 47 seconds worth of recorded field work. Digital initiatives again assisted me with converting these files, but this time, unsurprisingly, it was not so simple. We had to convert .mov to mp4 again, but some videos were also stored in .mts, .mxf, .avi, or acvhd format. And we also converted many WAV files to MP3s. Um, in the spring of 2019, when we started processing the collection, most of us thought that we could get through all of the content by late September. It turns out we were very wrong. All of us have been surprised by and grateful for the hard work and the dedication of the producers of this collection. Including the nine videos found on the DV mini cassettes mentioned in the slide, the total runtime of all collected material stretches over six days nonstop. Because of the incredible work of Grant Boltel and his friends, our timeline for finishing the project was shattered. And still to this very day, nearly a year after we visited Grant for the last quality control meeting, which Andrea will talk more about soon, I am still going over the content in the collection, watching videos and creating metadata in accordance with the policies and procedures that we've outlined and adapted 
before passing my initial metadata on to Andrea and our colleagues in digital initiatives to quality control with the many project stakeholders. Which brings me to another complex part of creating the metadata for this collection. The ever changing cast of contributors, donors, and filming locations. As you would expect, such an enormous undertaking required an enormous cast of contributors and producers, organizers, donors, film crews, folklorists, librarians, current retired and future university faculty, historical societies, archives and museums collaborating from all over. And as mentioned earlier, it was filmed all over the land through which the Absoluca were once able to freely roam. The size and scope of the content was astounding. And although the material on the second hard drive, the 2002 to 2016 hard drive, covered topics similar to those covered in the Spring Ranch hard drive, it also contains so much more. Grants, stories, and knowledge covers a huge range of topics, and we made sure to document all of this in our metadata. So although the content was loosely organized and dates and contributors were not very apparent upon first glance, as I began watching content on this second hard drive and processing the material into the collection, I would often discover missing contributor, donor, location, or date information as I watched. However, this was not always the case. We have still encountered many holes in our information or other little difficulties, such as fuzzy video or audio quality, occasionally only being able to hear audio in one ear, or videos containing footage of other tribes, or sometimes even audio of people that are not saying anything about the crow. Or files with us, excuse me, let me start over. Files with video and audio problems that were still able to be used and that still shared important inf information are included in the metadata and sent forward for quality control with their problems clearly noted. There was also one folder on this second hard drive containing 15 other folders full of audio, video, and images that was labeled unknown date. This was a little bit terrifying. But as I've worked through the collection, I realized that much of the material located in the unknown dates folder is actually duplicate content that has already been processed into the collection. This has come as quite a relief. We made sure to develop processes for doc documenting duplicate material and alternate angles in our metadata. And by continuing to communicate with the project's many different stakeholders and with each other, we developed a rigorous and inclusive quality control process that not only ensures accuracy in our metadata, but will also help us fill the holes in our information moving forward. So yeah, that's me, Grant, and an introduction to this collection and the complexities of developing metadata for it. Now I'd like to hand you over to my colleague, Andrea Payan, to talk to you more about the metadata and our thorough process of quality control. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, as Nick just outlined, metadata can be very complex, especially for a collection like this one. We do our best to overcome difficulties of this nature, and one of our most effective means of accomplishing this is employing crowdsourcing methods, whenever possible, to help create descriptive content and to improve overall metadata quality. Examples of this include outsourcing, organizing community events, and conducting metadata interviews. Outsourcing, as we practice it, involves the production of descriptive metadata by stakeholders outside of our cataloging and metadata services unit. Um, they include people like special collections curators, students conducting fieldwork projects, interns, collection donors, community partners, and digital collection users. Most commonly, different stakeholders are given instruction on basics of metadata creation, uh, the best practices, and then they utilize a simplified template metadata spreadsheet that guides their work, which is then submitted to various units for review. Cataloging and metadata supplements the initial metadata with additional formatting and content needed to meet the current local, regional, and national metadata standards set for the relevant system or platform. Community events that we have helped to uh, yeah, host <laughs> um, focus on collecting materials of a specific topic or area of interest. Uh, special collections, cataloging and metadata, and digital initiative staffs are at, are at these events to help collect, describe, digitize, and interview attendees. 
participants at these events have included researchers, community scholars, area experts, and donors. These types of events can facilitate networking on a deeper level than usual, providing a space to meet with communities where they live, work, and recreate. Uh, metadata interviews in which curators, field workers, donors, or community partners sit with cataloging and other library staff to provide assistance with material description are particularly effective for creating robust metadata. During interviews, we gather as much information as we can to answer the who, what, where, and when questions about a collection, and whenever possible, answer these questions at the item level. Metadata uh, the slide that you see above uh, is a photo of, of a metadata interview we conducted with Grant Bulltail last year. Nick and I, along with Randy Williams, the former Fife Folklore Archives curator, spent the day with Grant gathering information and asking questions to help improve our understanding and description of his work. It was a great privilege to meet him and it will continue to be a great privilege to work with him as we move forward on this collection. The next points will just give you more information on the general background of our decision making process for metadata creation. So preliminary planning for the Grant Bulltail collection involved discussions regarding where the collection would ultimately be made available. USU Libraries uses multiple platforms for digital collections, including Omeka for ex exhibits, ContentDM for digital history collections, and Digital Commons, our institutional repository for content produced by USU faculty, staff, and students. Each platform has different metadata considerations, so different choices would have different implications for processing and workflows. Since Grant Bulltail was a student of Austin Fife, that served as an adjunct professor at USU, and produced parts of this collection content while at USU, in that capacity, the decision was made to put the collection in our institutional repository. Uh, but I do want to mention that our colleagues from Little Bighorn College have suggested that we seriously consider putting this collection in Mukutu instead of or in addition to Digital Commons. Mukutu is an open source platform built with and for Indigenous communities. Planning and discussions regarding the possible use of Mukutu have been stalled, amongst other things, because of COVID-19, but we are expecting to investigate the feasibility of using this platform. Uh, my personal impression is that it would be very beneficial to use this platform to highlight Grant's collection and make it easier to connect this collection to other collections comprised of coordination content. Uh, the metadata planning process has been and will continue to be a collaborative effort between our library units as well as those who have already worked with Grant on other collections before. Uh, here's a basic outline of our metadata quality process, quality control process. Uh, stage one is underway now and further stages are soon forthcoming. In stage one, as Nick works with Grant's video files to produce preliminary metadata, he sends the spreadsheets to me to do preliminary checks for typical areas of metadata assessment, including checking for completeness, correctness, and consistency. After our first test submissions were completed, Nick, myself, and digital initiative staff met together to discuss important developments and identify areas of improvement. Our early conversations resulted in a general list of things to watch for. Some specific examples were avoiding duplicate titles, adding roles for creators and contributors, which were based on mark-related terms, uh, removal of references to file names and titles and descriptions, and consistent date formats. Uh, we have also discussed incorporating the Crow language wherever possible. Grant has assisted with a little of this so far, but we hope to develop this more, and planning and discussions are continuing on that front. After Nick and I go through our checks, Digital Initiative staff uh, then checks the files and spreadsheets to prepare them for uploading and ingest into Digital Commons. After the first stage of quality control, we plan to send a subset of records to Sharon Kaheen to evaluate and send feedback. And then as a final step, we will have Grant himself check a subset of records and send us feedback as well. Uh, we hope to be, we hoped to be further along in this process, uh, making this collection available to the public. And we are striving to handle this content with the proper care and consideration that it deserves. And we are grateful for the efforts of our colleagues inside and outside USU Grant Biltail and the Crow people who are help making this project a reality. Cool, so thanks Andrea. Um, yeah, and so just to kind of summarize things, Grant Boltel 
He's a, as a Crow historian and elder, a member of the Crow Cultural Commission and founding member of the Native Memory Oral History Project. He's a law director and pipe lighter in his People's Sacred Tobacco Society and a member of one of the last traditional storytelling families among the Crow. He has a long relationship with Utah State University. As a young man, he was a student of folklorist Austin Fife, and later in life, he worked as a visiting lecturer and adjunct faculty member. He donated over six days worth of nonstop oral histories to the Fife Folklore Archives that recount an untold history of how the Apsaluka lived. The account spans millennia and comes from an overlooked perspective of US history. Working with Grant and everyone involved in this project and really trying to center the voices and experiences of the Apsaluka has been an incredible honor for both Andrea and myself. And although the massive size and scope of the collection has caused us difficulties, it has also taught us a lot. This collection is so dense with important information and we would not have had it any other way. And finally, uh, moving forward, as you may have gathered from some of this presentation, we're going to continue viewing content and creating metadata, move into the intense metadata quality control phases with Sharon and Grant, continue investigating Mukutu and working with our partners at Little Bighorn College to incorporate Crow language and kind of expand the digital collections of Crow history and culture. Um, we also expect to be dealing with COVID-19 and everything that brings, as well as working on our transition to a new five folklore archives curator. And eventually, hopefully soon, we will share this collection. So yeah, that's pretty much everything from us. Here are some additional resources where you can go to learn more about Grant Boltel or hear some of his stories. Um, I believe that a lot of this will be shared in the chat. So yeah. And we left a little bit of time for questions, I think at the end. So feel free to ask us your questions in the Q&A. We have a thank you for the presentation so far. <laughs> thank you for attending, everyone. Yeah, you're, you're definitely welcome. OK, question. Are you just working on this single project? So this is the only project that uh, I'm currently working on outside of like course reserves based stuff, which is my day job. Um, but this is the only project with involving Crow history that I'm working on. Yeah, as metadata librarian, I do work on other projects as well, but um, the vast majority of the metadata work being done is, is clearly um, has been Nick. Um, so I just uh, supplement and help him on his way working through all that yeah so we have a question from sarah pomeroy as you now look back on this project what would you do differently at the beginning um personally i would have kind of like started looking at the other hard drives and the other content a little bit earlier. Uh, as I said in the collection, some of the different formats of the second hard drive kind of came as a surprise to us. And it, it took a little while to get the appropriate programs to convert some of those files and um, to get all of that involved. So I think I would have got that going a little bit sooner. Um, I would just add to that. Um... Um, in reference to the metadata interviews we try to do, um, it would have been great to have had more time with Grant 
personally um, yeah. because the, it really is um, an effective way to to make sure that our metadata is going to be representative of the communities that are part of those collections and ideally we'd like to go down to the item level and we just uh, did not have time for that for this uh, collection but when we do other metadata interviews for other collections and we have the opportunity to do that it really is uh, valuable and worth doing uh, there's more questions um, how do you handle tension between LCSH and terms that Crow Nation prefers um, at this time we have actually no plans to use official library congress subject headings we would prefer to use terminology that the Crow Nation or Grant um, or uh, people from Little Bighorn College can contribute to us um, because we know that their <laughs> subject headings can be lacking <laughs> in in that respect for sure so uh, we we may use general subject headings to apply uh, you know to uh, the the basics, but nothing specific, and in, in, in reference to the the tribes themselves or anything. Yep. So, so it looks like Anne is asking us, "Do you ever get tired of this collection?" And the answer is definitely not. Sometimes there's little difficulties that rise up, like not knowing like who is in a video or where the video was uh, located. But I've actually got anxiety sometimes when I feel like I'm getting to the end of the collection because I'm not tired of it. I don't get tired of listening to Grant. And yeah, but, so yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, so do you have any idea of how many search terms you've used to catalog the content of this collection? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Thousands, probably. Lots and lots. <laughs> lots and lots. And we've done everything we can to main cons maintain consistency. So, for instance, if I'm watching a video from 2002 about the son of the sun, an old red woman, and I watch a video from 2015 about son of the sun, an old red woman, I make sure that the keywords and the search terms in, for both of those are the same. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of keywords for a lot of content. And uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, so, um, Catherine asked, Did, do you get any additional funding or grants to help with this project? Or do you plan to in the future? Um, we would for sure love that. We initially hoped to get um, someone from the Crow Tribe to um, work with us uh, personally on this collection. Um, we've been discussing with the uh, Little Bighorn College on um, possibilities of uh, getting more help from them. Um, but yeah, that was the original plan. But I'm, I'm thinking especially when it comes to maybe implementing Mukutu and other things like that, we will most likely be looking into uh, getting additional funding from grants to do those things. Okay, what are the plans to incorporate the Crow language? So that's very much in development. Um, I think at this point we can say we would have to rely heavily on Little Bighorn College expertise mm -hmm. on how we can best do that. And it, um, otherwise, it, I think we would rely solely on Grant himself to help incorporate the language um, whenever possible. And that would be possibly limited, but it would either come from Grant or I think from folks at Little Bighorn or other representatives of the Crow tribe. Yeah. yeah, Andrea hit the nail on the head there. I have also, I have Grant's phone number, so I've had conversations with him about different words that he says and how to spell them and stuff. So I kind of check that before I add it to the metadata, the initial metadata. So oh, yeah, it's a difficult thing. Those were good questions. Cool, so it sounds like we're at time. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.
thank you so much for joining us. Our next keynote it will start right at noon. We'll allow people to log in and we will see you at noon.